Richard Bliss Brook here. We are live. We sit here today with none other than Mark Victor Hansen. Bob Proctor. This is Kendra Hall. Tanya Stringer. Jeff Canfield. Whit Jones. James Clear. Les Brown. People want to hear stories. I like getting stories out of my guests here. So thanks for joining us. Rudy Rivak was born in a refugee camp in Southern Germany and lived there until the age five. Farm work taught Rudy the value of hard work and persistence. Ironically, it was the farm that his dad used as collateral to secure a bank loan. So Rudy could get started in his first network marketing company. What was it the person on the other end of a random cold call said that inspired Rudy to drive 60 miles to just take a look? Find out during this interview with a 50 year industry icon who's founded three network marketing companies, expanded markets internationally, and been awarded a Direct Selling News Lifetime Achievement Award to boot. This mentor has no plans to retire because this is what he lives for, helping people like you reach their dreams. We're live all over the world with Rudy Revac. <laughs> Hello, Rudy. Hi, how you doing, Richard? You're looking great I'm there. I'm so good, life. and I'm so I'm so honored that you're taking the time to tell my audience uh, your stories about network marketing because you are one of the true icons of our profession. Ladies and gentlemen, this podcast, The Authentic Networker, seeks out leaders in the network marketing profession that have built ethical and legitimate and legacy businesses uh, in our profession with our model. And Rudy Revac has been a mentor and a friend of mine for, gosh, probably at least 30 years as I've watched him inspire people and coach people and um, share his philosophies about life and about business and about leadership and about network marketing. And he is one of the true icons of our business. He's a 50 year veteran of the profession. One of three people that's ever been awarded the direct um, selling news uh, lifetime achievement award. He's the founder of three network marketing companies, owner of three network marketing companies, Symmetry, Zingular and um, Pure Haven. Uh, and has got like a million people all over the world that are benefiting from his commitment and his leadership. Of course, it didn't all start with Rudy being a you know lifetime achievement award winner and owner of three companies. It started 50 years ago, and that's where we're going to go 50 years back, Rudy. And I'm going to ask you to tell us, Rudy, who was Rudy Revac? 50 years ago, what were you doing? Where did you come from? Tell us about your parents. We're gonna talk a lot about a little bit about your book and your history. We want to hear all of that. Who is this guy that has changed so many lives in the network marketing profession and how did you get started? All right, you want the whole story all the way back to- oh, I want the whole story right. and don't forget the chicken farm because oh. That could be the secret to success. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, well, it goes back to uh, my mom and dad, actually, their history, because uh, my mom and dad are Hungarian and Romanian refugees who escaped after the war to get away from the communists. And um, when I was five years old, uh, they were in a refugee camp in southern Germany, uh, where I was born as a refugee. And then when I was five years old, we came to America. Uh, that was 1952. And uh, I spent most of my life growing up on a chicken farm in the middle of New Jersey. And uh, we had 26,000 of those little suckers. So, <laughs> <laughs> and as much as, as much as I disliked it at that time and didn't want to be a farmer, uh, one of the things I realized today, it was a great experience and it's a great education because uh, if you're a farmer, you learn how to work. If you're a farmer, you learn how to persist. If you're a farmer, you learn how to improvise. I mean, uh, you know, um, you just, you, there's things that you just learn, uh, especially I think hard work is one of the good ones. 
Um, because, you know, uh, God forgot to tell the chickens that you're only supposed to work uh, six days a week and you have one day off. Uh, the chickens on Sunday, they still want to eat. They still want to drink. They still want to do all the stuff they do. So you learn quickly when you're raised on a farm that uh, work is something uh, that you don't just um, think about. It's something you look forward to. It's something that has to be done. And I think that was one of the greatest things that helped me in most of my life is that I had great parents who were very uh, loving, hardworking and persistent and also the hard work that came from working on the farm. Well, speaking of your parents, your story about finding your first opportunity meeting and what it was going to take to get started in the business. I mean, that's such a huge contrast from what it takes today for people to get started, which might be a few hundred dollars. And if you can't sell the product, the company gives you all your money back, right? Right. right. And uh, your story is quite a bit different from that. And I think the most inspirational part of it is how your father committed his whole self to your dream and your success. And I want people to hear that story because it's, it's really moving. Okay. Um, I, when I uh, came out, when I got out of the army, uh, when I finished high school, I didn't, uh, I didn't have the money nor the, I really the desire at that point to go to college. I went to work in a retail store and, um, I, and I wound up spending three years in the United States army. And I spent my 13 months in Vietnam. And when I came home from Vietnam, um, they said under the GI bill, I could go to college and they would help pay for it. Wow, they were willing to give me $271 a month to go sit in school. Well, I was good at sitting and I needed the money back then. <laughs> so I started to go to college full time in Trenton and I was working full time in a retail store when one day I came home from work and the telephone was ringing and it was a total stranger who was literally just calling people out of the telephone book. So when people today say, well, how do I recruit? How do I find someone? Hey, I, I've been here for 50 years because somebody picked up a telephone book and dialed a number and said, hey, would you like to make some more money? And I immediately said, don't hang up. I said, I'm interested. <laughs> I, I needed the money. And so, which is another thing, by the way, a lot of people today talk about selling product and it's right, you've got to sell product. Well, one of the best ways to sell product is get people who want to make some money. They sell right. the product. Uh, people out are now, they're in a car dealership selling cars because they love selling cars. They're out there because they need to make money. And uh, so they attracted me with the opportunity and they invited me to a meeting. I had to go 60 miles round trip because I lived in a little farm town in the middle of Jersey. I went 60 miles round trip to this meeting and I walked in, it was on a hotel and there were all these guys dressed in these nice suits and people shaking hands and welcoming me and they did this business presentation. And um, the guy went to the front of the room and the first thing he did was he wrote in big letters on the top of the chalkboard, in big letters, he wrote $30,000. Well, 30,000 may not be a lot of money today, but in 1970, $30,000 was a fortune. Uh, I was working in a retail store making about $6,000 a year. <laughs> so 30 grand was a fortune. And I would kept looking at that board all night. And then he went on to draw circles and discounts and percentages. And he put all kinds of things on the board. And the truth is I was a 23 year old kid. I didn't understand any of it. All I knew was if they could show me how to make that 30,000 bucks, I didn't care about all the rest of that stuff. I figured it out. <laughs> and so that was great. And I was excited. I went home that night. Now, the one negative about it was that in order to get started in that company, it cost $3,217. And I went home that night and I was all excited. And my dad asked me where I'd been and I drew some circles on a napkin on a kitchen table and I tried to explain <laughs> it to him, right? Of course, I couldn't explain it well. But my dad said to me that night, he said, Rudy, he said, those people are trying to show you how to work smart and not hard for the rest of your life. I, those were his exact words. Wow. And, and I said, yeah, dad, I said, man, I, but you know, it's $3,200. There's no way I can find $3,200. And so that kind of went away. And about eight or 10 days later, my dad came to me one day with a check for $3,200. 
and say, here, I want to give you the chance that we never had. Jesus, <laughs> to this day, it makes me emotional. <laughs> um, he put up the house and the farm to borrow that money from the bank to give to me. That's crazy, because Rudy, uh, how, at that time, how many years had he been toiling away on that farm? Well, this was 1970. We came to the States in 52. He we bought the farm at about 60. So at least uh, 10, 12 years that we were on the farm at that time. So 10 to 12 years of his hard labor, he just went down and put it all on the line. Yep. For some yep. circles you didn't even understand. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he did. And I got, and I literally got a basement full of soap. I mean, I, I know $3,200 doesn't sound like a lot today, but it, uh, put, look at it this way. When I bought my first new car, it was 1965. I bought a Ford and it cost me $3,200. It was new after I got out of high school. So what does a new Ford cost in today's dollars? 40 grand? Yes. So that $3,200 in today's dollars is about 40 grand, about 35 or $40,000. So just think how much soap you'd get for 35,000 bucks. I, was, that, was that best line or yes. was that was? Yeah, it was best line. Um, so I have a picture I'm going to have Amber, um, if she can screen share it, um, show you. I have a box. Rudy, I've told you this before. I have a box of B80. Yeah. Automatic dishwashing compound. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and B70 was the laundry detergent. And Ziff was the all-purpose cleaner. And, and, the, and the funny part was we sold that back then as being the first non-toxic, non-caustic, biodegradable cleaning products. And we used to stand up in the front of the room at night and we would squirt it in our mouths. We had a little board and we would do a demo of taking some crayon out of a carpet and off of Naugahyde. And then we, to prove that it was safe, we'd spray it on our mouth. Well, in today's world, you can't, can't even sell that product. Right. A lot of the ingredients in there are carcinogens. Right, <laughs> right, right. Well, there, there's, there's so many connections between Rudy and I. We have a lot yeah. of fun telling stories because most of you know I used to work in a chicken factory, not a farm but a factory and that's that was what my start was in network marketing but actually my start which is so ironic is in about 1971 my dad came home from a meeting in san francisco to merced california where we lived so excited about this new business and within a week or two a truck shows up <laughs> and we've got all these cleaning products in the house and my dad never sold a box or a bottle and only sponsored one person. And that was me. Yeah. Oh, so <laughs> and I never did anything. Too. <laughs> <laughs> and we used that truckload of soap box by box, bottle by bottle for the next 30 years. But I'm hanging on to that one box of dishwashing soap. <laughs> Good for you. Now, I'm going to frame, frame it and send it to you. You also joined a company that had a, a pretty big uh, investment in those days, didn't you? I did. You know, it was uh, $10,000 and my story's so similar to you, Rudy. I went to my, my I went to the meeting. I did I had no idea what they were talking about. Bunch of circles. I went to my mom who I didn't live with at the time and I never asked her for anything because she would never give me anything. I just lost my mind. I went to her and I said, Hey, uh, I went. I want to start this business, and um, <laughs> she she listened to me for about ten minutes, and I'm sure I was making no sense at all. She got up and walked into bedroom and came back with a check for um, I think it was maybe five thousand dollars, and I think that's what I needed. And <clears throat> she just handed me the check, and I just took the check and left. I was so shocked. And then typical of my mom, the next morning at 6 a.m., she called me. And this is, you know, a small town in the 70s. She'd already called the banker at home at like 5.30 in the morning and told him to cancel payment on the check. Oh. Because she, she like came to her senses that why am I loaning my son money? 
So then I just used the typical ploy. I, you know, my parents were divorced. So I went to my dad and I said, you won't believe what my mom did to me. <laughs> so he gave me a third mortgage on my house and that's how I got started. Right. So. Yeah. Great. We have very, very, very similar. similar. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know yeah. what? You know, one thing, Richard, I think people is, who might be watching this, especially in, in today's network marketers have to understand, people call sometimes want to say, well, those were pyramid companies. They were, well, you got to understand in those days, there was no UPS, there was no Amazon, there was no FedEx, there was no, in order to get products to somebody, you, it took weeks to send yeah. the products. So we became the local distributor. Right. That's where the name came from. And we were a local distributor to would recruit people who would want to sell the product they would come to me i give them the product they go sell it and so on it was it was a necessity back in those days not a they yeah. and i don't know about you rudy but if i could have got in for two or three hundred dollars i'd have quit within a week or two right and, i couldn't exactly. i couldn't quit because i had this investment exactly as i tell people all the time I, the first nine months I was in this business, I was the best. I was the most amazing. I was the most outstanding failure that they had. Yes. I did nothing. I mean, it was terrible. I probably would have quit if it only cost me a hundred bucks. Right. And, and it's, it's so much has changed and not necessarily for the better in that case. But so you were a miserable failure for nine months. You have four defining principles, hard work being the first one. What turned it around for, for you, Rudy? And you you have such a gift, like some of your mentors, Jim Rohn, Bill Bailey. I mean, to be able to be mentored by those people early on. But what, what was the difference? What took you from nine months to 10 months? What popped? What changed? What sent you doing the right things in the right way? Um, well, first of all, Richard, I think what I'd have to say is, the, the first thing that made me did it was the fact that I was willing to continue to persist. I wouldn't give up. Now, without that, I would, the other ingredients wouldn't have come along. And so I always tell people that that's the first ingredient. Just because you're failing, that doesn't mean you're not doing well. You're learning, you're growing, you're right. I, I, as long as you're moving forward. You know, again, you said Jim Rohn. Uh, Jim Rohn was a mentor. And, you know, his, his uh, constant philosophy was for things to change, you have to change. For things to get better, you have to get better. And I bought into that. So during that negative time, I was still going to meetings. I was still going to the trainings. I just wasn't getting the results yet, right? I was, I was hammering on the nail, but it wasn't going in yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I was sticking around. And that's the most important thing I could say to anybody watching this is in direct sales. Done, quit. <laughs> And so was there a defining moment or something that happened, yes. somebody that joined your team or what happened? No. What happened was there was a gentleman named Marty Day. Marty was my upline, not my uh, my direct upline, my upline, what we call back then a regional director. Right. We, we didn't have multi-level as we do today. Uh, you, you Once you became a certain level, in my case, it was called a general distributor. The next thing to do is become an area coordinator. And you did the meetings and got an override on a specific area. The next right. level was regional director. This fellow was my regional director, Marty. And he got a hold of me one day because I was always going to the meetings. I was, I was enthusiastic. I wanted to do it, but I wasn't having any results. And he had a, he had a breakfast with me at the Holiday Inn in Somerville, New Jersey. I remember it like it was yesterday. And he said, Rudy, why aren't you doing better? And I had all these excuses. Well, they, you know, I'm young and the other people don't have any money and the friends I have, they won't come. And, and, and I had all these excuses. And he said, he said to me, he said, you know what's wrong with your excuses, your list of excuses? I said, what? He said, your name's not at the top of it. <laughs> <laughs> and it, of course the meaning was, although big deal, you got excuses. The real problem is you. So he said to me, he said, Rudy, if I ask you to do something and I promise you it'll help you to get do better, will you do it? I said, Marty, anything. Tell me what to do. I'll do it. And he reached in his briefcase and he gave me, took out 10 paper clips and he gave them to me. He said, put these in your left pocket. Put them in my left pocket. He says, now I want you to go out every day 
and talk to somebody about your business. I don't even care what you say. Talk about the products, talk about the company, talk about the opportunity. Just talk to 10 people every day about Best Line. I said, okay, I can do that. He said, now every time you talk to someone, you get to move a, a paperclip from your left pocket to your right pocket. And I want you to promise me that every day you're going to move all 10 of those paperclips. I said, I'll do it. He said, now you can't move nine one day and 11 the next. It's 10 a day. I said, Marty, I said, I'll do it. Dang it. <laughs> so I, I, now I didn't use paper clips. I wound up using 10 pennies in my pocket because when I took the paper clips out of my pocket, they tear the edge of my pants. <laughs> right. So they put a little, so I put 10 pennies in my pocket every morning and I, and I started going out talking to people about the opportunity. And pretty soon some people started to say, yes, I'll buy. And some people started to say, yes, I'll, I'll come and look at your meeting. I couldn't believe it. And yeah. the difference was, as you know, Richard, from your history in this business, you, you know already, it was just because Marty understood what my problem was. I wasn't talking to enough people because every time I'd go out and get a no, I'd feel so bad. I'd get so discouraged. I'd look like I lost my dog. Right. Nobody wanted to follow me. And I wouldn't talk to anybody for the next week <laughs> until yeah. I went back to the meeting and they pumped me back up. What he got me doing was he got me not thinking about results, but thinking about activity. That's a huge, that's such a huge distinction for people. That right there. Well, a couple other things that you're, that one being consistent. So notice he didn't say you can't do it whenever you, every day, seven days every a week. Day. And you know, that just like chickens, people are out in the world looking for opportunity, looking for connection. People are alive and moving around the planet seven days a week, not six days a week, not three days a week. The world operates seven days a week. And the difference between <clears throat> talking to 10 people a day every day and talking to 10 people a day whenever you feel like it or every three days is huge. And right. that's the difference, right? That's what causes people to make it or not make it right and my philosophy today for people is not maybe 10 for somebody is too much for yeah. me it was okay because i wanted to make money i needed to and i was willing to do whatever okay maybe four is your number right but you got to do it every day yeah you can't do it when you feel like it when the kids aren't in, aren't in school you can't do it when the weather's nice or uh, you know when you're not on vacation you got to do it every day it's got to be one of those non-negotiable things like other things you do every day. Like I ask people, so do you feed your kids every day or whenever you have time, right. whenever you feel? No, you feed your kids every day. Do you take a shower or brush your teeth every day or whenever you have time to? There's certain things people do every day. And, you know, our profession is plagued by this stigma of, <laughs> hey, you know, 99% of the people that try to make money don't end up making much money or they end up quitting or failing. But what you and I know is 99% of the people that fail don't actually do the work. And the people that do the work, which you could get by with one conversation a day. You know, if people just had one conversation a day, they would outwork not 99% of everybody else in their company, not even 99.9. .9. They'd be one out of 10,000. Amen. If they just had one conversation right. a day, every day, it's not that hard to make this work. But people just don't want to, they don't want to do the work. Right. Exactly. It's interesting. They get in out of it. They're used to having a boss tell them, show up at eight, go to lunch at 12, come back at one, go home at five, and you better be back tomorrow morning at eight or you make no money. And they do it. All of a sudden, they're in a business of their own and they have to do something. Oh, I'll put it off till later. I'll get up a little later this morning. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk to my three or four people when I have a chance. Yeah, so no and I think another connection there, Rudy, is belief. And I want you to talk about belief because what I found is one of the reasons people don't do the work is they don't believe in the outcome. And I think that's a gift that you and I were given early on by our mentors 
is even though we didn't understand the circles, we stayed engaged in that conversation long enough with mentors who cared enough that we finally understood the circles, really understood them, understood how the math worked, how the model worked. And we learned to believe that if we did the work, this team of people would grow, this team of customers would grow, this volume would grow, and we would achieve extraordinary results financially from that. And that motivated us to do the work. So many people today, they don't even understand how the model works. They don't really believe if they do the work, it's going to pay off. So speak to that. How, how did you learn to believe that if you did the work, it was going to pay off? Well, I think there's two sides to, to belief on what you're saying, because you're 100% right. One of those is the belief in your company, of course, and, and the opportunity itself. And the way I gathered that was by talking to the people when I went to the events. Okay, it was one thing to look at a piece of paper and say, oh, Sally Jones made X amount of money or had this award and so on. Well, I didn't know Sally Jones. But once I went to the events, which by the way, in my opinion, is still super important, belly yeah. to belly, one-on-ones, uh, uh, -on because it was at those events where I would get to talk to Sally Jones and she was just a homemaker, but yet she was making a thousand or two thousand dollars a month. And that's what I wanted to do. So the belief in the company came from being around the people who are doing it. Right. The success stories. Yes. The heart, the hardest part of belief for me anyway, because I was a chicken farmer. I was a young kid. I'd never done anything. I had no big education. I was all of the things that people would say he'll never make it. OK. And, and in today's world, I still think that is the case that most of the people have a hard time believing in themselves. We are so put down on all of our lives. Think about it. From the time that we we're little kids, um, if you do good, people, eh, they're nice to you. They may pat you on the back a little. But if you do bad, what happens? Woo I got they spank pile you. on. So you're recognized for doing bad. Then you go to school to get an education. And you have a test in school. And you, you have a, a test with 10 questions. You've got eight right, two wrong. The teacher takes a big red pen and puts two check marks and says, look, stupid, you got two wrong. Right. <laughs> and you say, well, well he, come on. She doesn't say look stupid. No, she doesn't say the words, but they point out what you can't do. You say, well, how could you do that different? Simple. If I was a teacher, I'd take a big red pen and put eight check marks and say, look, right. you're almost perfect, man. You are great. But that's not life. Then you get a job. You do your job great. You even put in some extra hours. How often does a boss compliment you, put your bat on bat? Very seldom. But do something wrong, what happens? You're done. Yeah. So most of society has taught us what not to do, what's bad about things. I mean, if you watch the news media, all you hear about what's negative. They don't talk about all the great things that are happening to people who are doing well, the people who are succeeding, the people who are traveling, having fun, building lives full of adventure. They're not showing my grandkids who are happy every day with life and right they're showing all the negatives of life and so it's very difficult for a human i in my opinion in today's world to be positive and stay on that positive side of life because there's so many negatives out there so, so how did you do that what did you listen to what did you read what did you study what were your practices that had you develop your mindset as a young man a couple, uh, thank God again, I had a great mentor named Jim Rowe, okay, on personal development. And I bought into his entire philosophy. I was young and I was just a sponge for his philosophy. And one of the things he, uh, that I did in those early days that was part of Jim's philosophy is was I got away from the negatives. I got away from all those people who were negative. My friends, relatives, uh, they, you know, uh, people would say, well, you mean to tell me if my relatives comes up and says something negative to me, I should just walk away. No, <laughs> run. Get the heck out of there. He's trying to destroy you. Get away. He's setting you on fire with negative. So I got away from the negative friends I had, the people who, who, who were trying to put me down for what I was doing. And I started hanging around more 
with the positive people, meaning at the meetings, I'd go to the trainings, I'd make sure I was on the calls, I'd make sure I was involved with the positive side of life and not the negative side. Same thing, I started, I, I eliminated a newspaper at that time. I didn't wanna, I stopped reading the newspaper, all the negatives about life, rapes, killings, riots, murders, suicides, and all the horrible things that go on, that starts to affect you, right? And, yeah. then number, and then on the opposite side, yes, I started to read. They convinced me to read things like Rick, Think and Grow Rich, The Magic of Believing, The Magic of Thinking Big, the, um, all of the great books. Um, tell you a funny story, I can show them to you right here. Look at how, look how old these things are. They're all that ready yellowed. I don't know if you just, can you see that? They're yellow. Sure. Okay, you know why they're on my desk? This is called The Magic of Believing. This is one of the books I first read. You know why they're on my desk? I pay my grandson, who's 14 years old, I pay him 20 bucks for a book to read. And it's all the old classics I got him reading. Yeah. And he gets 20 bucks for reading one, and then he has to do a report to me from it. Brilliant. Um, I so, think yeah. we had an advantage, Rudy, in that our mentor said, you know, here's three books, read these. And today, people's disadvantage is there's 300 books. Yeah. And so what we tended to do with magic and believing and think and grow rich and the magic of thinking big. And we tended to read those books 10, 15, 20, 30 times. Right. Keep going back and studying them where today the model's more um, the badge of honor of, you know, I read a book a week. I've read 52 books in the last year, but I don't remember much of what I read and I can't teach any of it. Mm hmm. And by having a limited number of mentors and resources, we tended to master the material and then actually be able to teach it as opposed to just brag about how many books we'd read. I agree. I agree. And, and, then, and then we shared with our organization the things that we were reading, right? We did. That, that, yeah. was that simple. So anyway, yeah. that was that. that um, I think that's one of the best things that uh, I could say is you've got to keep feeding yourself and it never stops. It never stops. You've got to continually feed yourself because the world is constantly attacking you with this negative. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I've admired about you, Rudy, your whole life is I've watched you for the last 30 years mm -hmm. more than you know. And you are you're a great inspiration of walking your talk and being in integrity with your word. You are a man who is who he says he is. He, you, you do what you tell other people to do. You're an extraordinary role model in that sense. And I think that's another important key for all of us is you can't fake it here forever. You can, you know, create a new attitude and create a new image. But if you're living a lie, the world's not going to manifest the abundance you're looking for. And you've always just been a great role model in living that truth. And it's gone way beyond network marketing, right? And to the rest of your life, beautiful family and the things that you do with your life, the people that you help that nobody knows about, the, uh, the great accomplishments you have in sports, you know, race car driver, and you've seen so much of the world on your Harley or, and from your airplane where, you know, you're a pilot, you're a all over the country Harley rider and a race car driver. And, you know, these are things that most people only dream about. But you've taken what you were taught about success and network marketing, taken it way beyond network marketing into creating an extraordinary life. Yeah, I and, and thank God for this industry. I mean, it, it, this industry is what gave it all to me, which is why I still love doing it after 50 years. I love being involved. If it wasn't for this industry, I don't know what would have happened. I would have wound up in a factory works somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> you probably would. And a lot of people would uh, not be benefiting from that. So tell me your, um, what is your viewpoint on the network marketing model? the model that we grew up with, the model that created freedom for you and I, where do you see that in the future? And what are you doing in your companies, specifically Zingular? What are you doing to inspire people to understand, respect, and manifest that model? And 
And what do you see for our profession in the future? What do we need to do as a profession to keep that opportunity alive for people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question, especially in today's world, Richard, as you know. Um, this uh, pandemic at, uh, last couple of years has uh, been a real negative for us for a couple of reasons. And I'll go back into history. When I, uh, when I ran out of um, people to talk to and I needed uh, to uh, prospect, uh, and we used to do prospecting by standing in malls and asking surveys and <laughs> handing out cards. Uh, would you like to make some extra money part time? I mean, all those things to prospect. Well, one of the things I did back then was I used a newspaper. And some of the young people watching this probably don't know what a newspaper is. It no. <laughs> uh, and I put newspaper ads in the paper. And when I did that, I got a few people interested and, and a couple of people joined. The problem was, guess what they wanted to do as soon as they joined the business? They wanted right. to put an ad in a newspaper because that's how right. they got it. And I'd say, right. no, 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 I want a list of names. Give me your list of names, let's contact. Well, no, I'm just going to put an ad in the paper like you did. Like, ah, that was tough. Now, the reason I'm saying that is then the next phase came along for our industry. And that next phase, I'll say, was uh, VHS tapes. Remember those big square oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. VHS tapes? And at that point, everybody was saying, oh, all we, this is going to change the whole industry. All we got to do is have a good tape and we're going to have some celebrity on that tape. And then we send these tapes out that send 10 tapes out a week and you're going to get rich or uh, uh, audio tapes. Dead doctors don't lie and you're going to be rich. Remember that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Guess what? Yeah, that worked for a little while, but then it ended. Then the next phase came along. It was called the Internet. And it, I can remember going to DSA meetings and in the front of the room, there were people saying the direct selling industry is over because right. the Internet is going to just take over everything. Nobody's going to be buying from anybody except over the Internet. Right. Then the next phase came along, which we're in now, and it's called social media. And everybody went to social media thinking that that was the magic. And did it work? Yeah. Some people got some business from it. But does it last forever? Nope. And there's the problem. And the real negative during this uh, uh, pandemic time, in my opinion, remember, I'm giving you my opinion, obviously, <laughs> during this pandemic time was it got so easy when people sitting home had nothing to do, they were just signing up. And then as soon as things opened up again, boom, they went away. Well, the people who had signed them up got used to just signing people up for doing nothing yeah. without any. And so now our biggest challenge, I'll be honest with you, is getting people back to the basics. My entire motto right now and every conversation I do with our sales leaders is back to the future. You yeah. want a future? You get back to the what made you do it. And every one of our <laughs> leaders that are having a little bit of a difficult time, and I say to them, Tell me, tell me what you did to join to get you going. Oh, I did this and I did this and I did that. And I was doing three way calls and having some home meetings and I was getting people and I was getting lists of names. And I, well, what changed? The business hasn't changed. Who changed? You did. <laughs> because they, they don't want to go back to work. I mean, that's the long and the short of it. I think yeah. a lot of people fell in love with the idea and what was taught to them for years that all you need to do is dance on your head, show people your food, make funny videos on social media, and your your following is going to go through the roof, and people are going to join your team. And there are some people that that's worked for, but it's not duplicatable, right? Exactly. If, I'm an, if I'm an influencer and I have 100,000 people following me and I say something about Zingular products and people start buying... That's great, except the people that join me, they don't have 100,000 people on their social media channel. It all goes back to, unfortunately or fortunately, this is network marketing, which is people reaching out to their network and telling a simple story. I found this product. This is what it did for me. If you got the same problem and you're looking for a solution, give it a try. It's that 
storytelling outreach, anybody can do it. You don't need a social media following. You don't need 10,000 audio tapes or you don't need money for a newspaper ad. And whether it's artificial intelligence or social media, I mean, there's always going to be something that's a fad. But if you want to be successful, I think like you say, Rudy, you got to stick to the basics, go back to the basics. Such a profound question. What did you do the first year or two to become successful? Just do that. Right. Worked. Worked. Keep yep. doing it. Go back. But it's very difficult to do that for the average person because especially after going through a period when things are too easy. <laughs> like the yeah. pandemic. So it's getting it's harder getting them out of that that uh, mindset. But it's it's working. We're getting them out there back to the you, basics. And you right. you are. You have a very, very successful, highly motivated organization, which is a reflection of you and great management team. So um, a couple things I want to mention and post in the comments. Uh, you, you wrote a book, which was an extraordinary accomplishment about your family, about your grandparents and your parents, I think maybe even your great grandparents, uh, Iron String, which people can get on Amazon. And Amber will post a link to it. It's an extraordinary story of immigration and courage and vision and being American, becoming American, living the American dream. And it's something I know, Rudy, you are passionate about, the distinction of taking opportunity for granted. You know, it's about two o'clock in the afternoon in Houston. Somebody already died today trying to get in this country. In fact, right. probably more than one right. already died today just to get here, to have the opportunity to do what your family did, to do what you did. And so many Americans just take it for granted. You yes. want to share a little bit about that book and that story and what it took for you to write it? Um, yes. Um, the, uh, what happened was when I was a kid, I heard little bits and pieces of this story of my mom and dad's story as they escaped and went through the war. But uh, I didn't know all of it. I didn't, I didn't get really interested in knowing it until I got older, which is normal for kids, I guess, yeah. right? But let me give you a little condensed version. My mom and dad were a little, in a little German community in Hungary on the border of Hungary, Romania. My dad was born in Hungary. My mom was born in Romania. My one sister was born in Romania. My other sister was born in Hungary and they were all born in the same town. <laughs> <laughs> because it kept changing hands under the old austro and Hungarian empire. And it was in a German community. They spoke German. And the reason for that was because my ancestors were um, uh, lumberjacks from the um, uh, uh, Schwarzwald, the Black Forest in Germany and who went there to work for a serf in what today is known as Hungary and Romania. Okay, so they're in this little town. They've got their own farm and everything. My grandpa, after World War I, comes to the United States to work in a factory in Passaic, New Jersey, in a tannery and sends home money. With that money, my dad, as a little boy, he was only eight years old, and my grandma, who happened to be an alcoholic, so my, my dad at eight years old was actually running the farm with these American dollars, they could buy horses and land. And in those days, money had no value it was all horses and land and mm -hmm. animals that was the value. And they became fairly successful. And the goal was that they were gonna then come to the United States when my grandpa had enough money. Well, they shut off immigration in about um, 1920 something. They stopped immigration, zero immigration which people don't know today. They keep hearing about, oh, well, oh yeah, anybody could come at any time. That's BS. Mm -hmm. um, and so my grandpa went back to Romania. They were very successful on this farm. My dad had built up as, again, an eight, nine-year-old boy. And um, he became the mayor of this little town. Fast forward, World War II comes. My dad winds up being a German soldier. Because when the Germans took over Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, every country they took over, every young man of fighting age became a soldier. 
And the worst part was they were the ones that, that were put on the front to die first, were yeah. all these others. So he wound up, again, to condense the story, he wound up on the Russian front outside of Moscow. Those pictures that some of you might have seen about the, the soldiers dying in the snow, no boots, very little food. He was one of them. At the end of the war, he gets captured by the Russians, being marched to Siberia. He didn't know that. We know today that's what happened to all those um, prisoners that the Russians got um, to work in the mines in Siberia. At the same time, the Russians are moving west and taking over all these countries after World War II. Poland, Hungary, Romania, Czech. Well, my parents, my grandparents, my mom and my sisters knew the Russians were coming and they had to flee because the Russians were bad people. The communists killed people. They raped the women. They, they destroyed the properties. They, so they had one day to load up a wagon and get out. And they weren't alone. There were hundreds of other refugees too. And they had to, they had to make it going by night because the Russians with planes were looking for them during the days, they had, to, they had to make it over the Danube River into Budapest. Once, we're in, once they were in Budapest, that was their goal. Now they were with the Allies, the Americans, the English, the Australians. That happened. At the same time, my dad escapes from the Russians as a prisoner. He breaks out the back of an outhouse and runs. Wow. I mean, wow. it's like, almost like a movie. It would make a movie. And he worked his way back and, and eventually found my mom and my sisters in a refugee wow. camp in Austria now because nobody wanted these refugees. They kept moving. Them. So he finds them in Austria. Then the Austrian government says, we don't want all these refugees and sends them to Germany. Southern Germany saying, here, you allies, you take care of all these refugees. We don't want them. And they would just take the families, put them on a truck, a military truck, and drop them off at a farmhouse and say, here, farmers, you take care of these. Then what else could they do with all these refugees? So we wound up, my, not we, my parents and my sisters wound up in, at a farmhouse in southern Germany. And then my dad went to work, became a good worker, got in construction, they got a house of their own, blah, blah, blah. That's where I was born as a refugee at that time, during this time. Well, my grandma and grandpa could come to the United States immediately because he had been here. Right. My dad went two times to go to try to get permission to come to America. And he was rejected, rejected because he was a German soldier. Now, that doesn't mean that he, he wasn't a Nazi, or anything, but that got him at the bottom of the list. You know, of, it wasn't one of the favorable things. So he and now a uh, little. Am I boring you? Am I? No, no, no. Keep going. OK, so a little backstory. When my grandpa was in the United States working in that factory on Sundays, he would go to a relative's home and have lunch. And there was a lady there who was a single parent. Her husband had died in, a, I think, in a war or something. And she had a little boy. And he would take this little boy on Sunday afternoons for a walk in a park. And the little boy would teach my grandpa some English. And my grandpa taught him some German. And they became friends, a uh, young boy. So fast forward. Now we're in uh, after World War II. My dad goes for the third time to try to get permission to come to America. And he says to my mom, he says, Maria, if if they reject me this time, we're just going to stay here in Germany. We'll make our life here because it's, it's just not they, you know, he was working by then. They had a little house of their own. The things were going better. He was a contractor. So he goes and he has his paperwork and they had this uh, table full of judges. They called them. Now, they were military uh, officers, uh, captains in the military, lieutenants, captains. And these were what they called judges. And these were the people who decided who went and who didn't. My dad puts his paperwork down at the table in front of this uh, judge. And um, the guy looks up and says, ha, ah, Stefan Revak. That's a Steve Revak in German. Stefan Revak. Do you know another Stefan Revak? My dad says, um, yeah, my dad's name is Stefan. Huh. He says, was he ever in America? My dad says, yeah, he was in some place, I don't know, called Passaic, New Jersey, or something like that. Make a long story short, this captain in the military is that little boy that my grandpa took on <laughs> Sunday afternoons. Do you believe that? Yeah. Talk about a godsend. I mean, there's no yeah. other explanation. And he said, Steve, you're going to America. <laughs> 
And that's how we wound up coming to the U.S. in 52. And my parents wanted to be here so bad. They loved America. They wanted freedom. They wanted opportunity. They, they were hardworking, honorable, God-fearing people. I was very, very, very lucky to have the, if I, you know, I've often said if, um, if God took me and put me back and said, okay, you can choose any parent you want, they're the same parents I'd, I'd choose. So well, that you what your father did to launch you in business, and what your grandfather did um, to befriend that little boy. <clears throat> those are powerful, powerful life lessons. Uh, last night, Rudy, Kimmy, and I watched the three episode series called Arnold. It's the story. It's it's Arnold Schwarzenegger's uh, autobiography documentary. Mm. You seen it? Mm -mm. No. You and Pam are going to want to watch it. It has some incredible parallels to your life. Hmm. He was born in Austria. Right. Great story. Really great lessons. On Netflix? Uh, yeah, probably. I don't remember. I'll but find. yeah, you'll find it. It's good. Really, really good. Hey, the last thing I want you to share with people, Rudy, is if if they still have some chills in their body about taking advantage of the opportunity that America provides, let's not leave that to generations of 50 and 100 years ago. Let's do it again today for us and for our children and our grandchildren. And there's no better model on the planet still than network marketing, exactly. where you can get hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of people using your products, contributing to your income, build it once, get paid for life. Where else can you do that? What would you tell somebody who's stuck, somebody who's worried, in doubt, somebody who's moving but not moving fast enough? What's a couple of things you would tell them to do right away so that they can have their defining moment? and launch their business? Well, if I was going to condense it into a few simple things, I'd say number one, you've got to know where you want to go. You've got to decide where you want to go. I know, I mean, forever you can read books about goals, right? Goal setting, where, what do you want to do? Where are you going to go? That's the key. Um, so sit down and decide what it is that you want to be in the next year, the next two years, the next five years. Number two, and I'm condensing this because I could spend a half hour on every one of the right. subjects, right? Number two is you gotta be willing to go to work. And it's not, it's not hard work, it's activity. It's get active and do it on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're part-time, fine. I don't know how many hours you have available a week, if it's 10 hours a week. Well, 80% of those 10 hours have to be used for activity in building your business. And business building means prospecting, showing the plan, talking about the products, getting a new person, look, doing a meeting uh, for you or for one of your people. 80% of your available time has to be used for getting new business. 20%, 19% uh, of your time you use for training. Training yourself, training other people, helping others succeed. Great. That leaves 1% for solving of problems. And the problem with a lot of people is they reverse that. All of a sudden they get a few people in their organization and they allow them to steal all their time. Oh, well, I didn't get my product on time. Would you call and see where it is? Um, <laughs> I, you know, I got, I got a box and there were, there were 10 bottles in it and one of the bottles was missing one tablet. Would you call and, you know, <laughs> and they want to steal your time. And so, you say, well, Rudy, you said, but you got to help your people. Yes, you help your people. And the way you help them is you say, Sally, I understand that order didn't come. Tell you what, here's what you do. You call 1-800-COMPANY and they're going to fix it. You talk to Sally there. She'll, well, I don't have the time to call. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll help you. Here's how I'm going to help you. I'm call 1-800-COMPANY <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise I'll keep stealing your time. They and will. so go to work, activity is the key. How many a day are you going to do? How many uh, things are you going to do? How many people are you going to talk to on a daily basis? The third thing that I think is vital, and that is we talked about the believability. You got to work on your believability and you do that with reading, 
listening. In today's world, I mean, all of the good books are on tape. But right. don't listen to the, no offense, but don't listen to these network marketers who want to tell you how they did it 400 years ago. Talk to people who are doing it now. You're right. Yeah. And if, you, if you're in an organization and you got some new upcoming people, go see what they're doing. I'll tell you what they're doing. They're using a list of names. They're using three-way calls. They're doing home meetings. They're doing it belly to belly. They're going to events and meetings. That's how they're doing it. Get back to the basics or back to the future. Believe. The next thing I'd say is, of course, your attitude. You can't do anything without having a positive attitude. I mean, that's without saying. Um, and people will follow not what you say. People follow how you feel about what you say. They don't care about your product. They care about how you feel about your product. They don't care what's in your product. They care about how you feel about your product. They don't care about the ingredients and uh, what the science is and oh, all those things are nice. I, I get people all the time say, well, Rudy, that's not true. People care how a product works. Yeah. Have you ever flown on an airplane? Ask how many people and ask them how an airplane flies. The principle of aerodynamics. <laughs> no, very few people know what that is. <laughs> but they'll but they'll spend thousands of dollars. They'll get in, the, in in this machine that was built by the lowest bidder for thirty billion dollars and have and two strangers up front who they don't even know take by them a, thirty thousand feet in a plane in a plane designed fifty years ago. Yeah, <laughs> and they don't know how it works. Why? Because all you care about is will we get me from here to there safe? If you believe that. You do it. Well, that's that. See, that's in your attitude. If you are strong about your product, someone says, hey, uh, I've got this great product. It's going to help you lose weight. Well, how's it work? Well, I don't know, but I got these three people. They lost 10 pounds in the last week and they are just doing great. Well, what's in it? Look, I don't know what's in it, but I know it's safe. And I got these three friends who who they did. You understand? That's what people buy. It's your attitude, not the product. Yeah. And last but not least, the thing I started with which made the difference for me, and that is persistence. Don't quit. There's going to be ups and downs. We're in a downturn a little bit from the last couple of years in our direct selling industry. Yeah, big deal, right? See, people say, um, well, when you, when you started your business, did you have any bad times? Were there any bad nights or sleepless nights and stuff? And they assume you're going to say yes. Well, I'll answer like, I don't remember who it was, but some famous guy said, yes, I slept like a baby every night when I started my business. I was up for every two hours crying <laughs> 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 because I didn't know if it was going to work or not. It took a month sure. to get product and half of it came leaking. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And how many times? I mean, I did this. I built, I built business here. I did it in Canada. I did it in Germany. I did it in Italy. And not just the, the company. I built personal businesses in every one of those because when I went in and took over a company, as the head of the company, I went in and I started building because then the people that were there that weren't doing well, who kept saying, oh, you can't do it here, it's hard. They shut up as soon as I went and got some distributors. <laughs> yeah, that's leadership. And, and that's the secret to all of the people that are listening to this and their organizations aren't doing well. You, the way you motivate them is go do it yourself and all yes. of a sudden they'll follow. Watch this. Watch this. Rudy, thank you. You are a true blue, rare. Um, you're a national treasure to the direct selling and network marketing model. And I'm glad you're so healthy and so articulate and so passionate because your voice and your story and your philosophies and your vision are going to be inspiring people for decades to come. Because I, I know you got no retirement in you. No, sir. <laughs> Just service. So thank you so much. And all of you out there watching the Authentic Networker podcast, please share this with your teams. Share this to your to, with your channels. Hang on to it. Remember the lessons. And next time you're sitting in front of somebody that needs to hear some Rudy, <laughs> give them this link. Hey, and uh, Richard, if I may say, look, I, I also honor you. You've been doing this for almost as many years as me. You have done some great successes and look how many people you're helping with your podcast, with your information, with your books, with all of the things that you're doing to drive this industry forward. So congratulations to you too. Thank you, Rudy. Hey, thanks for all, for all of you for tuning in. We'll see you next time at The Authentic Networker. Good Ciao. afternoon. <laughs>